there's enough question on it uh, last week that I thought it would be valuable for us to um, look at um, Revelation 20 um, to get that time frame there. Um, and Revelation, tw or sorry, not Revelation 20, Revelation 12, um, to get that time frame there. Um, Revelation, as we looked at, as you all remember everything about uh, from 2013, still in your heads, um, I know. Um, <laughs> um, when did you come in 2014? Yeah. Yeah. I came first time I came in July, but I wasn't around in the whole time. I don't think I yeah. started Sunday school till that winter. Yeah. Okay. Well, That's just <laughs> Yeah. That's just up there, but we're not we're not we're taking a, a parenthesis here. Um so uh <laughs> So Revelation 12, Revelation covers um, essentially, mostly from the ascension of Jesus um, until um, the new heavens and new earth. And, and it covers it, depending on how you look at it, seven to more times. And it gives us all these pictures throughout Revelation, like when you, when you are looking in Old Testament prophets, they're doing the same thing. Um, Ezekiel is not going chronologically from Ezekiel 1 to Ezekiel 48, I think it is. Um, and, and, uh, you know, Isaiah is not going chronologically from Isaiah 1 to 66. I know there are 66 chapters in there. I think it's uh, Ezekiel's 48. Um, but what they do is they give uh, vision after vision after vision, uh, representing the same thing, different angles of it. And you see Jesus operating this way as a prophet when he's teaching uh, during his incarnation, right? He says, the kingdom of heaven is like, how many times does he say that? It's like 25 times, right? But he's, he's going over the same thing. And then sometimes he's going over a different aspect of the same thing. Or sometimes he's covering it from a different, you know, now let's go over to the right side of the road and look at it from there. Same event, okay? And that's how God communicates to his people in the Old Testament prophets. And that's how he communicates uh, through Jesus in the parables. Jesus is communicating to us that way about the kingdom of God. And he has parables that, that cover, you know, basically from his birth to his return. Um, and the book of Revelation does that as Jesus reveals uh, personally and through uh, an angel to the apostle John um, things that they needed to know when? When is the book of Revelation written, probably? Okay, 95 is a good date for that. Um, who's, uh, what, what are the circumstances into which Revelation is written? Not Nero. Domitian, yeah. So Nero's in the 60s. And Nero wipes out Paul and Peter. Uh, he, he kills them in Rome. Um, and so that's the 60s. Uh, Nero's around. Nero dies June June of sixty eight. And, and Titus. what's that? Titus after that. So and then uh, Titus. There are, there are a few that come in in between. There's kind of a battle for leadership in Rome um, around then. Uh, Titus is a general who comes in and wipes out Jerusalem in seventy A.D. And then I think like a, about a year later, maybe as as long as two, Titus, who is the general who wiped out Jerusalem, finished off the J Jewish war. Um, he becomes uh, Caesar, uh, Titus does. Uh, but on down the line, in the 90s, comes Domitian. Um, it's spelled with a T, T-I-A-N is how you end his name. Um, so like D-O-M-I, like dominoes, but then T-I-A-N. Uh, so Domitian. And one of the um, thoughts in ancient uh, societies was very common in ancient societies was that the king whether you called him Caesar or, you know, we get Caesar from Czar from Caesar, you know, those are related. So whether we call him Caesar or king or Pharaoh, you know, sometimes Pharaoh is called Pharaoh, king of Egypt, um, that, that these leaders of nations are, are viewed with this basic idea that the king is divine, come from God and his son who comes to bless his people. Okay. 
And so you see this especially uh, in the Gospel of Mark, which is written to Roman Christians, Christians in Rome. This idea that, but, but it kind of permeates, but, but very much in Mark, that uh, Mark is saying, uh-uh-uh, it's Jesus, Son of God, come from heaven, who's come to bless his people. And as many as her, are his citizens, they are the blessed. And so the Gospel of Mark starts, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the Roman centurion, you know, a Roman centurion at the end says, um, surely this was the Son of God standing at the cross. Uh, in the middle, Peter, uh, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ, which means what? King. King the Son of God. Okay, and so this was not a false idea that God sends a son to rule over his people and to bless them. This is probably, since we see it in cultures, probably something that we long for in, our, in the image of God that's in us, to be ruled by God himself and for his rulership to mean for us blessing. Uh, and so as like other cultures all, now this is a little bit different angle, um, as they look across all ancient cultures, they see an account of a worldwide flood. Now, this makes sense because all cultures came out of what? Noah. A worldwide flood and the sons of Noah. And so it makes sense that all cultures would have this account of a worldwide flood. And, and we do, in fact, see that. Uh, and secular historians, you know, affirm that, that there's this, you know, they'll, they'll say this myth um, but uh, of a worldwide flood, but it's seen across cultures. But um, I think they also say what the, essentially it's one culture created the myth and then everyone kind of plagiarized it from there. Yeah, which happened, but it's not a myth. Right. It came from Noah, you know, and then, you know, because they all experienced this. Literally, the father of all three um, divisions of man, Shem, the Shemites, the Japhethites, and the Hamites, um, you know, they all went through the flood. So they told their kids, and they told their kids, and so on, and so on, and so, so Yeah. Yeah, Shalane. Back in the um, prehistoric days when I was in college, um, we did a study of, like, pottery and things yeah. like that. Uh -huh. And they did say there was signs of a, you know, major flood. Yeah. And that's that they could date some of the pottery from that point. So, yeah, yeah some say it's a myth, but in that case, they had physical proof yeah. that something of that magnitude happened. Yeah. And just, and, and yeah, so there is physical proof. And that's what, you know, the, the, the myth, you know, we should really put that in parentheses. We do see even the geological age layer, you know, that most of the fossils are all in one layer. And how do you get a fossil? You have to encapsulate something while it's alive with no oxygen. So what's a way to get, good way to do that? Smash it in wet mud and then pile a whole bunch of more mud over there so no oxygen can get to it, which is what the, the flood describes. Um, God brings up uh, water from the depths of the earth and it causes the, the, um, the, the water to fall out of the sky. And, and so you've got this, this massive uh, flow of mud coming up over all these creatures that were not on the ark. And so it would make sense that there would be a great uh, fossilization layer um, somewhere in the crust of the earth, which is, in fact, what we have. Okay. Um, so um, uh, the... Book of Revelation um, covers over and over again this Son of God um, comes to earth. Most of it covers ascension to return, but then there are some of these pictures as we go through Revelation. Some of them also have new heavens and new earth on there, and some also have history of Israel or birth of Jesus before his you know ascension. Okay. So we've got ascension to return, and then some of the some of the visions John gets also tack on a little bit more at the end, or also tack on a little bit more um, at the beginning um, to do with Jesus. And so Revelation 12 is a great place just to see um, how uh, uh, almost a summary 
um, that it, in a very short time, it gives us this whole process of Jesus. So let's go ahead and, and read this. And let's start from the back. So Aaron, let's have you on verse on verse one uh, there of Revelation 12, and then over to Joyce through David, and then let's come across to you folks, and then um, and then Bob to Laura, and we'll just see. And I guess we'll work our way up front, and then then come over there. Okay. Verse one, Aaron. A great sign appeared in heaven: a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. Okay, so um, twelve stars on her head. What do we have in scripture that's 12? Number of things that are 12. Okay, tribes of Israel. And so there we are. I mean, we could guess apostles, but it's not going to work. And so let's let's go, you know, that's what this is. This is Mother Israel. Um, and in Mother Israel, there are 12 tribes. Okay. All right. Uh, verse two, Joyce. Verse four. Okay, we'll stop right there. Um, so, uh, any guesses as to the dragon? The various empires. No. Satan. Satan. Okay, and it's it's defined for us. I I I'll uh, see if I've got it listed here anywhere uh, in verse nine. Um, yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, so, Bob, would you go ahead and read verse nine for us? The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Okay, so we cheated down there. Looked at verse nine where it's defined. Okay, now who's the dragon? And now, now the dragon leads the nations of the earth, and we'll see that in chapter 13. But um, uh, I want to just, um, so um, uh, Satan's there. Um, he's he's a, a, an adversary. Now, that's just parentheses, and then we get to verse 4, and it says, now, going on with the woman. Okay, now what was the woman about to do in verse 2 or whatever? Give birth. Give birth. Okay, and then in verse 4, what does the dragon try to do to this child that's being born? Devour it when it, gets, when it comes out. Eat it. Okay, what do you think this might be talking about? Jesus, Jesus that's right. Um, so who did this for the ancient serpent uh, that is uh, the dragon? Herod the Great. Herod the Great. So when Jesus is being born, Herod tries to wipe out Jesus. Okay. Now, we'll see in, in chapter 13 how the, the uh, great dragon uses you know, a sea beast and a land beast to do this, sea beast being the governments of the world. And so Herod is sea be you know, a representative of the sea beast that's always against God's people, that kind of thing. That's chapter 13. But for right now, we just say, okay, this is um, when that child is born, when Israel gives birth to its featured child, Jesus, Satan tries to kill Jesus at birth. Okay, so that's what we have so far in the first four verses. Um, all right, now, Jeff, verse five. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child will snatch up to God and to his throne. Woo, so long, a, a bunch of stuff happens there, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what in the future tense will this child do? So will, future tense, rule, rule. rule all nations. Okay, so, you know, it sounds like a squirrel, but I'll say Jesus. No, it sounds like Jesus, so we'll say Jesus. Jesus will rule all nations. But then, what? not only does this child not get swallowed up or not get killed at birth, but then what happens? Snatched up to God. So what's, what event is that? The ascension. The ascension. Okay, now, did Satan try to kill Jesus a second time through the government? Yes, who is that? Pilate. Pilate and Herod Antipas, the, the son of Herod the Great. Okay, and so um, 
So this double whammy where um, the, 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 the great serpent or the, the ancient serpent, the dragon, is trying to kill this male child. And the first time, physically, he doesn't succeed. The second time, he succeeds physically, but only for these three days. But then this child is snatched up to heaven, Acts 1, chapter, chapter 9, or chapter 1, verse 9. Okay? Jesus ascends up to heaven. And so here in these first um, five verses, uh, we have Israel, Jesus' birth, uh, the attempt on Jesus' life by Herod the Great, Jesus' life, Jesus' death, and Jesus being snatched up to heaven, his ascension. And so we've gone from Old Testament Israel to, you know, A.D. 30, um, could be A.D. 27 is another possible date of Jesus' death. Um, but um, there we are, those first five verses right there. Okay. Um, going on, Ashley, could you read six for us? The woman fled into the wilderness to a place of care for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Okay. So um, now uh, we'll, let's just uh, cheat a little bit here again and look to verse 17. And... Um, Blake, you want to read 17 for us? Awesome. Isn't that great to hear kids read God's word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so... Who are these people who are being persecuted? Christians in the Roman Empire. Yeah, Christians are, are these people who be, are being uh, chased around. Those We see it there. Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So again, we have this definition later of something revealed earlier um, there. And so the picture here is, you know, Satan tries to kill Jesus twice. He maybe thinks he's won at first, uh, the second time, uh, but then he hasn't. And so then what's he do? What's plan B for Satan, who did not understand about the resurrection and the ascension and the plan of salvation, who was just trying to kill Jesus, thinking that that would end it? What's Jesus, or what's Satan's plan two, plan B? Attack the church. Yeah, attack the church. Okay, does that fit history as we know it? Yes. Yeah. That this stuff all fits what we know from Scripture, from scriptural history, and from the history of the church beyond the, the end of the New Testament. Okay, um, 1260 days, um, that's the period of time the church is persecuted. Um, so what do, we, what do we know about that? Will there come a time the church is not persecuted? No. no. When will our persecution cease? When Jesus returns. Okay, so when Jesus returns, that's when our persecution ceases. So how do we define the 1260 days? We don't. It's just that. Now. Okay, and who, who is in the last days? And? And the apostles. And the apostles. Okay, Jesus says last days are now. The apostles say last days are now. And we're in these last days. Uh, and so we, we talked about that like three months ago, right? Last days is, you know, boom, boom, boom. Jesus says, you know, we're, you, you don't recognize the signs of the times, he says to the Pharisees. Um, Peter says it at Pentecost. Peter says it in Second Peter. Um, Paul says it. The writer of Hebrews says it. Jude says it. They all say we're in the last days. Um, so first century, they were in the last days. We continue to be in the last days. 1260. Now, if, if you're, you know, if you remember from a few s sermons back, maybe about a month ago, 1260 days is the same amount of, how many months is that? 42, 42 months. How many years is that? Three and, a half. Three and a half years. Okay. How many years did it not rain when Elijah said it won't rain? Three and a half, three and a half years. Okay. James confirms it's three and a half in James 5. Um, Hebrew rendering of it in the beginning of, of 1 Kings 18 says, you know, after three years, 
And when Hebrews say after three years, they mean a full 36 months has happened. And now we're not yet to 48 months. And so you see that with dating of kings and various things like that. When it says this was in the, the third year of King so-and-so, it means you're almost to the, you know, somewhere before year four, actually the fourth anniversary. Okay. So, um, so back to verse six, um, the woman, um, flees where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. So during this time of persecution, um, what's happening to us from heaven above in this verse? We're cared for. We're cared for okay. So imagine this, if you're, um, one of these, in one of these churches in Turkey being written to these seven churches, and you're under this persecution of Domitian, who's, um, enforcing the recognition of himself as divine God come to earth. And uh, one of the issues was that we see in the, the letters to the churches is what we know historically as well, that there were trade guilds. So if you were a, a Roman plumber, um, that you needed to be, be, a, be a part of the union or the trade guild. And part of the trade guild was that you had to give um, a recognition to Domitian as God. And if you weren't willing to do that, then you couldn't be part of the trade guild, and then no one, you weren't allowed to be hired. So you had economic hardship, which we see some in two of the letters to, um, in the, the uh, chapter two and three in Revelation, economic hardship going to some of these people because it involved not giving uh, recognition to Domitian as God meant your income was gone. Okay, and so that's great, great hardship. Right. Um, but uh, even in this, God would take care of you. Um, and even if in Revelation, as it goes through, um, you know, even if you die, God will take care of you then. And that's the thing. It's, it's like um, uh, our, our true home is in heaven and uh, numbers of showings in the book of Revelation that those who have already died um, because they wouldn't give obedience or, or recognition to Domitian as God. What do we see in heaven in the book of Revelation in regard to that? What about these people who have died in the Domitian persecution? They're in heaven with Jesus. They're in heaven with Jesus. John has shown these people who have been beheaded for, the, for, uh, for their belief in Jesus. Okay. And, the ones in heaven, yeah. yeah, are saying, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? Their blood was spilled out by Domitian or his soldiers there. And Jesus' answer to that question is what? Wait a little longer. Yeah, wait a little longer. This is the fifth seal. It's in Revelation 6. Wait a little longer until I do what, Jesus save says? all your brothers. Yeah, until I save all your brothers, until I've gathered all your brothers in. So Jesus is in the process now, great commission, of gathering all the brothers in of these first century believers who lost their heads, so to speak, or went to the Roman Colosseum and were torn apart by beasts, um, or uh, that um, they are, um, these people are, are, their souls are in heaven with Jesus now, and they are just waiting for all the elect to be gathered in. And Jesus says, and I'm not going to avenge your blood, second coming, final battle, final judgment. I'm not going to avenge your blood until then. Because when I come back, it's total. Um, I'm going to take care of everything when I come back. Um, so, but until that time, the church on earth, think about yourself as one being pressed, you know, suppose... Uh, uh, Joe, Joe Biden or Roy Cooper were demanding that we name them as God. And so they, they were coming, you know, we thought, you know, we hear someone coming in the door middle through Sunday school and we say, uh-oh, is that Ed, Eddie and Pandra or is that officials of the state coming to gather us in? Uh, but this is God saying, but I'll take care of you. Whether by life or by death, I will take care of you. Um, and so hold, verse 17, 
hold to the testimony of Jesus. So that's the significance of that phraseology there. Rather than believe, but hold to. Despite losing your life, hold to the testimony of Jesus. Um, and those who are holding to the testimony of Jesus are taken care of for 1260 days. This period of, of great distress, like in the days of Elijah, when you didn't have food and water, um, and the, <laughs> the military horses and mules didn't have food and water, and so you were very susceptible to foreign attack. Um, okay, does that make sense so far, verses 1 through 6? Okay. Um, uh, verses uh, 7 and onward, so we're, Bob, you did read already, so we'll go over to, to Laura, verse 7. Okay, so what's going on here? War in heaven, it's after what? The ascension. The ascension, okay. So we, we don't absolutely know, you know, we could say here, is this final battle when Jesus comes back? At this point, we could say that. We're not going to be able to say that in a minute. But, or is this right when the ascension, when Jesus arrives in heaven, that there's this war in heaven? Um, it's going to be that. And we'll see how it has to be that if we just keep reading. Um, all right, next, Bill. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. Okay, so the dragon, who uh, we've been, we found out from verse 9 from Bob, who's whom? Satan. Satan, uh, is not strong enough, and they, so who would they be? Satan and the demons. Yeah, fallen angels, demons, we call them, um, lost their place in heaven. So, again, this is what we talked about last week. How long is Satan and those who, angels who followed him in the initial rebellion against God in heaven, how long are they there? Until sometime after the ascension. Until sometime after the ascension. Okay? And then we say, wow, that sounds funny and weird. Um, but then we say, but this makes sense of what I see in the Old Testament where? Job, Job 1 and 2. All the angels come and report to God. And God's having this conversation with Satan, who's there in heaven. Um, and then last week I kept saying um, 2, Saint, 2 Kings 17. Sorry, that's the exile of the northern kingdom. It's, it's 1 Kings 22. Micaiah, the prophet in the north, and he's speaking with Ahab and Jehoshaphat. And you see this heavenly scene uh, where there are these evil spirits or demons uh, in the heavens. And God says, who will go for me to be a lying spirit in the mouths of these prophets who are before um, Ahab and, and uh, Jehoshaphat? Uh, and so it makes sense of that as well. So Old Testament, two different times, we have a showing that the fallen angels at least some of the time, are there in heaven in the presence of God. Okay. Um, and that it's after the ascension that they're cast out. Okay. Yeah. So the prevailing understanding, at least in America, is that Satan rebelled, he was cast out, and they tempted Eve. Yeah. But there's no biblical evidence to support that. And that the, really, the reason it's prevailing is because of dispensational approach to Scripture? No, I, I blame everybody on that, not just dispensationalists. So uh, the, the thought is just, just this, that um, so Satan rebels. He, he shows up in Genesis 3, and he's not on God's side. He's trying to get man and woman to disobey God. And so the thought there is just, okay, so now Satan's on earth. He must have been cast out of heaven. But there's been no um, narrative that has supported that. And then as you look at the narrative more, Job 1 and 2, um, for, first uh, Kings 22, and then Revelation 12, you see, no, when Scripture speaks of it, it shows that Satan and his, and his followers are still in heaven until this point after Jesus' ascension. It's, it's interesting. It's an interesting phenomenon how we try to complete things without 
not actually being informed of them to kind of complete the story. Yeah. And, you know. We fill in details. Right. Yeah. And based on whatever cultural nuance or whatever. But when you actually read the evidence, when you actually read yeah. the Bible, there's no inconsistencies in it. Right. And it, it doesn't maybe, it doesn't conform to what we are prevailing understanding of it. Right. But it conforms to how it, how it presents itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, and so, um, uh, the, um, yeah. So, so the idea, you know, that God cannot be in the presence of evil, that was another good, good comment that, uh, uh one of you brought up, um, uh, last, last week to afterwards. And, and so we say, well, is that true? Do we see scripture saying that? And we don't see scripture saying that. And then we look to our theology and say, God is omnipresent. God indwells, you know, Allison and Steve and all of you with saving faith in Jesus, and you're in the presence of evil. One of the arguments of, of Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 6.19 is don't engage with a prostitute physically because the Holy Spirit lives in you and you're the temple of God. And when you commit that sin, you're bringing the Holy Spirit into that act. That's what Paul reasons there and says. That's one of the places where we're told individually that we're temples of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, honor God in your body, he goes on to say in the next verse or two verses after that. Um, and so God is able to be present in the presence of evil. We know this from our doctrine of omnipresence, which we get from Scripture. And we read in Colossians 1.16 that Jesus is holding all things together and this world is full of evil. We sin, and the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us before we sin, okay? So that's a doctrine that God cannot be in the presence of evil that is wrong, unless we claim sinlessness, or unless we claim that the Holy Spirit leaves us before we sin, or unless we claim that God is not present on the earth or unless we claim that Jesus is not holding all things together, or unless we claim that Job 1 and 2 is not the word of God and it's false. Okay, so have I killed that one for you thoroughly enough seven times over? Yes, yeah, Steve. So then God's presence are, is with those in hell? If he's omnipresent? Is yeah. Wow. Not his blessing presence. Right, right. So God comes. So think Old Testament. You don't want God to visit you, do you, if you're misbehaving. God speaks in those terms. Then I will visit you. And he comes, he comes in judgment and he comes in blessing. And that's the distinction the Old Testament makes and the New Testament makes. God comes. He comes at the Red Sea. He comes in blessing for his people who have believed and walked across in faith. And he comes in cursing to the Egyptians, equally present to curse them. Jesus holds all things together. Nothing exists. Jesus holds Satan together. Jesus holds Hitler together. No one is independent. No one has independent existence and there are no independent places to him. The issue is that Hate hell today and the lake of fire is devoid of any blessing in that presence. It's the judging, condemning presence of God that is there alone. And that's, so yeah. Been well. Yes, and that's the key word. That's, that's the anathema hell. in our church. I've always heard and I've always been taught. We say, where is that in the Bible? And that's exactly, we've all been taught that, Steve. And, and you're, you're just, you know, um, wonderfully making the point for us all, you know, that we've always heard, you know, that hell is the place where God is not. And we just, we just want to make that distinction. Um, by the way, I got um, hung up on this on uh, my presbyter ordination and justified in it. <laughs> because that a parallel question of that was being asked. And, you know, I, I, I um, was talking about common grace. Christ in his common grace today, um, as Paul uh, says to the uh, church in Lystra, I believe, um, God has uh, filled your 
filled your bellies full of food and given you joy in your hearts. He says that to pagans. Um, and, and so there's a measure of love and kindness that God shows prior to judgment, prior to death, um, to unbelievers, even if they're not elect. Because he's holding together the food and putting it in their bellies. He's giving them um, wealth, and a mom and dad to take care of them. This is, this is David. You don't treat us as our sins deserve. And that's common grace. Um, now, it's not a salvific love that God shows to his non-elect. But God cares for his image. And that's one of the reasons murder of the worst person who's ever lived on earth is a sin. Because God's image exists on that person. And we are not the government who has that authority to end that life. Okay. So this, the sin yeah. of murder is not just the sorrow of it all, but also the usurping of a power that isn't yours. That's right. So, so two big things with murder is that you don't have the, the authority to take life. Um, and so you cross that line. That's God's realm. Um, and the other, the other thing is, is that you are killing in an indirect way something that represents god it's, it's another example of how inconsistencies or misunderstandings fade away when you actually contemplate all the information like, yeah like this idea that hell is just the absence of god is a fundamental misunderstanding of what righteous judgment is yeah i mean if you believe that then you have to believe that god has no part in the judgment yeah does yeah and yeah judgment. yeah and so good so so just just to, to keep in mind big big thing for us to consider i know a lot of these things i'm saying one they're fundamentally um uh um taught in the history of the church and in any good systematic theology book you go to westminster confession all that kind of thing um and but but not common out there in the church right now being taught and so it, it comes to our ears as strange but, but big, big point here, God is everywhere, omnipresent, um, ubiquitous. Jesus is holding all things together, um, but he's in some places blessing, and he's in some places cursing. And today for unbelievers, it's a mixture of that, and we call that common grace. They're not saved, they, don't, they still have guilt over their sins, they're still under the, the, the curse of suppressing the truth and not being honest with life and themselves, and that's a curse, right? If you're not honestly dealing with the facts before you in life. Um, and, 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 but, but yet God is, as Paul says, putting food in your bellies and giving you joy in your hearts as he talks to these pagans. Um, and, and so um, that's, that's common grace. That's what Jesus talked about. Uh, God, God uh, sends the rain and the sunshine on the fields of the righteous and the unrighteous. Um, and, and his application of that is love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. That's the same clip of the Sermon on the Mount. That's what Jesus is, is um, supporting. Um, these people bear the image of God and God is kind to them. Uh, I love the, the Luke 6, Luke includes uh, Jesus' words there. Uh, be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful, as he is merciful to the, um, the ungrateful and the wicked. God is merciful to the wicked and the ungrateful. And so Jesus says, and you do that too. Be merciful, be kind, be loving to the uh thankless the ungrateful and the wicked and so we do the same thing um, so that God is present everywhere um, in the end it'll be full curse full blessing and everything will be separated um, when a person dies heaven and hell their souls you know uh, as much as a soul can be cursed yes as much as a soul can be blessed yes um, and, and now we're in this, this mix of things. And some have common grace, uh, which just means God is letting them live and their life is not just total misery. Um, 
and some have special grace on top of that. Those are the saved, those who know God and know life and aren't suppressing the truth and all those kind of things. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah, isn't that crazy? Crazy cool. Crazy cool medallions. Yeah, there we go. It's a little shocking, too, yeah. because you always grow up with omnipresence of God. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, but that stops at hell? Right. So, it's, I mean, there's such confusing messages. And yeah. So, it's just strange. It's like, okay, that makes sense, because if he's omnipresent, but then you wonder how can he be present with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, as a human being, I don't want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, God is, well, that's just the mystery of God. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how it could be omni if he's not present in everything. Yeah, yeah. So, well stated. Let's, uh, let's end with that. Let's pray.